Welcome to another episode of Poor Folk Needs for Community Justice. Now, Cecil is out of town for this weekend and next weekend, so I'll be doing this week's show. My name is Bill Olson. I'm the guest host. And uh, we're going to cover a lot of topics today. There's an awful need for justice on a lot of different topic topics. Uh, maybe many of you have seen me on my show, 9-11 was an inside job and other state crimes against democracy. And lately, Cecil has been showing some 9-11 information on his show. He asked me to maybe show a little bit more, especially about the uh, discovery of, of an explosive incendiary, depending on how it's deployed, called nanothermite. And uh, there were many scientists who were involved in the discovery and, and investigation research, and ultimately uh, they wrote a scientific paper that was published in a technical journal, a chemistry journal, and uh, there's been, you know, the, the way that that in the scientific community, it's been fully accepted. Uh, any scientist that wants to refute it would simply write a paper showing how it was done wrong or, or how the conclusion was wrong or whatever. But the point is that the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, that was uh, doing the 9-11 scientific study uh, never ever even tested for explosives and they used a circular thinking that we don't think explosives were used therefore looking for them would be a waste of time. Uh, come on, they're supposed to be scientists. Their science careers are being usurped by politics. Well, I'm going to show a 20-minute clip here of Dr. Niels Herrett. He's a, a multiple PhD in chemistry, and uh, he's going to talk about the thermite discovery, the nanothermite discovery. So if the control room's ready, go ahead and roll her out. Today, in my presentation, we will zoom in on the dust, which uh, we have all seen several times in the presentations preceding this one uh, and oops and uh, in such huge quantities in what was called pyroclastic clouds me and the pyroclastic cloud is a dust cloud which is hot there was plenty of dust and influ it influenced so many people in new york city one of them being a woman who was living on the corner of Cedar Street and Liberty Street is this corner here. Her name was Janet McKinley, and she was allowed to come back to her apartment about a week later, and this is what it looked like. There was a thick layer of dust all over, and she had a cleaning job to do. She kept some of it for the purpose, eventually, of making it into a piece of art, because she also had an artistic mind. We put this, this dust into a plastic bag and apply a magnet onto it. I have taken actually a small sample out of this bag, put it into a smaller bag here, and I also brought a little magnet here. You should take the bag horizontally, or you can also put it vertically, and then apply the magnet to the dust, and you'll see something coming along. Play a little with it. The challenge for you is to isolate a black uh, line of particles following the curvature of the magnet. The, ma the magnetic field is strongest at the edges. So try to pull out some magnetic material from the bulk and eventually isolate what probably will be a black a black line of small particles. And this is some of the stuff you can isolate from the dust by the means of the magnet. <clears throat> it was first presented to the world in 2007, on December 15th in Boston, by Stephen E. Jones. Following this uh, publication of Stephen E. Jones, I was asked to join this team of scientists investigating these red grade chips. And the work eventually ended up in a publication on April 3rd of 2009. The paper is based on four samples, 
Janet McKinley's sample is on the corner of the World Trade Center Square Plaza. And the other one here is from the Brooklyn Bridge. Sample number three and sample number four is a little north of that. In all four samples, we found these red-gray chips. These are the four samples, A, B, C, and D. When you heat these chips up, they react. What we're aiming at now is, you're already, you should know, we are talking about nanothermite, we're talking about the thermite reaction. You have seen this reaction scheme many times already. You've seen, and it was invented, it's an old thermite, it's a very old thing. It was invented by Hans Goldschmidt, a German chemist, in 1893. It was patented in 1898 and applied for the first time in 1899 for welding of tram rails in Essen in, in, in uh, Germany. Because in the thermite reaction, as you have already heard now many times, you form elemental iron <coughs> at a very high temperature. So it's very useful for welding. This picture also was shown by Kevin Ryan and these are the various uh, residues, these are chips which all have been into the different the DSC machine. We are taking them out and we are observing these reaction products, the, uh, the, the metal spheres. And these pictures also shown by Kevin Ryan is what the chips look like when Kevin is preparing the nanothermite in his backyard and we see the same red chips here. So um, if what else? So we believe that we have found what we call nanothermite. Let me repeat. You have a plastic matrix, and in it you have very finely dispersed aluminum and iron oxide, and that's it. An explosive must act by means of force. It is a chemical reaction where a gas is evolved, and you knock things over like that with the pressure, with the force. And it is, has, in order to do that, it has to be very fast. The characteristic of explosives are not that they're energetic, but they are fast. They deliver their energy uh, in forms of, of ga gas pressure very, very fast. But thermite and thermate acts by means of heat, contrast to ex explosives which acts by means of pressure. And relative, even though we saw Jonathan Cole demonstrating th these wonderful experiments in his neighbor's neighbor's garden, he um, we they are still slow on the time scale of explosives. Explosives are very very fast. Some of the explosives, actually, the combustion zones move more than twenty times the speed of sound. This is TNT, a very common explosive, trinitrotoluene, and this is. RDX, it's called cyclotrimethylene trinitramine. And the reason why explosives are so fast is that the electrons only have a very short range to go. The, both parts of the reaction are actually in the same molecule. So in TNT, the electrons only have to move from here and out to the nitrogen group. This is a distance less than one-tenth or one billionth of a meter. While in, in say, in gunpowder, which is a mixture of powders, the electrons have to move from one particle to the other. Fireworks, rocket fuels, and old-time thermites. In nanotechnology, you, you start with composite materials, but you make the particles smaller and smaller and smaller. And this is this is what happens to a thermite reaction. As you make the particles smaller, it, it, the time of reaction gets shorter and shorter, and then, of course, you deliver the energy to in a much shorter time, meaning that the effect gets much higher, and eventually you approach the delivery rate to that of molecular materials. The advantage of thermitic materials is that the energy content per volume is much, much higher than the unconventional materials, meaning that you can pack much more energy into a smaller volume than you can do with dynamite or TNT or RDX.
incendiaries which act by means of heat, they must by necessity be thermitic. And this is what we have served, molten iron in the rubble, molten iron coming out of the south tower, and these iron spheres being formed unambitiously indicating that thermite must have been there one way or the other. Now I will show you a video which David Chandler did not show. And um, I must admit that up until this point, I, um, I did not, as I said, indulge in hypothetical blast scenario. I wouldn't I wouldn't speculate where the red grade chips fit into any blast scenario. But upon watching this one, I changed my mind. This is the destruction of the South Tower of the World Trade Center, viewed from a helicopter to the south. This particular video clip is rich in details that call the official story into question. Notice the numerous explosions on the west side of the building above the impact point. As the top 30 floor section falls, it tips to the east. It starts off intact, but then it disintegrates in midair. Gravity alone could not cause the top section to disintegrate. When an object is in free fall, there are no internal stresses. It should have hit the ground in one piece, but it didn't. Some of the debris is clearly being accelerated by forces other than gravity. These effects can be caused by late firing explosives, which can produce a white smoke trail. White smoke, consisting of aluminum oxide, is a byproduct of the thermite reaction. While producing this video, I ran across one rocket projectile I had not seen commented on before. This one stopped mid-air and changed directions. Even taking perspective effects into account, this projectile lost one component of momentum and gained another. That requires an impulse. Note that the rocket trail does not point back to the building, but the point where the impulse occurred. Let's take it from the top. There's a lot going on. Watch for the smoking guns. This is outrageous. And when I saw this first time, I said, that could be our red grade ships. Look at these trails. Uh, and now, up until this point, I thought all the white dust coming out of the towers was crushed wallboard. There was plenty of wallboard, in, and it's white. But this is not what wallboard would look like if you crush it and throw it out the window. These are rocket trails. And, and this byproduct of a thermite reaction. While producing this video, I ran across one rocket projectile I had not seen commented on before. This one stopped midair. This is crazy. It goes out like this, and then it changed direction 90 degrees. And it still tracks a, a white smoke trail after it. What, what are we looking at here? This is rocket fuel. The number of responders has been discussed, what I've seen in a medical journal, and the estimate is between 60 to 70,000 of people were exposed to the dust for an extended period of time. And last year, there were published a paper in Experimental Health, Health Perspectives by a group of of, of doctors from the Mount Sinai uh, Medical School in Manhattan. And they looked into the lung tissue of World Trade Center responders, and uh, we should see what they found. The picture to the left here is from a lung tissue, and they found some thread-like tubular structures in four out of seven patients which were ill uh, in numbers ranging from 11,000 to 230,000 per gram wet tissue. This is the same material which they found also in the World Trade Center dust, which is moving around here somewhere. Carbon nanotubes, what are they? Well, they are tubes made of carbon, but they are very, very, very small. They are very, very strong. They are hundreds of times stronger than spiderweb. Formation of carbon nanotubes requires 
three conditions must be fulfilled. You must have very high temperatures and you must have a, a source of carbon atoms, which means an organic chemical present, and you must have a metal catalyst among which iron happens to be one of the best besides cobalt. And so this triggered the thought in some of us, well, this means that ignition of the nanothermite should be ideal circumstances for formation of nanotubes. So this is this is the residue. Kevin, he took. You remember he came in. He took he took the beaker and you show and you saw down into it. Yes. He left it cooling a little bit. He put it into a letter and sent it to me. It is here. And what I did then is to take a little sample out of this, pouring a few milliliters of alcohol ethanol onto it, making a slush. In a, in a mortar, actually, letting the particles, all the metal particles, all the heavy particles precipitate. And then you take a little drop of, um, of, of the supernatant liquid. You put them onto a copper grid, which the panelists can also see here. They're very, very small. And you let the ethanol evaporate. You put them into a transmission electron microscope. And this is what you see. This is the perfect dimensions of carbon nanotubes. This is carbon nanotubes. I wouldn't, I wouldn't come, obviously, I wouldn't come up with this if I didn't believe what I was saying. This is carbon nanotubes. This is a picture from the patients that Mount Sinai study. This is what we find as a product of the nanothermite reaction. And please remember that none of the control group showed this feature. So if you ask, couldn't the nanotubes come from somewhere else? It's true. It is formed combustion of diesel and, uh, and uh, in much, much smaller amount and in oxygen start fires. But the control group have been living a normal life except that they actually caught uh, asbestos fibers. And they, none of them showed, showed um, carbon nanotubes in their lungs. The goddess of justice, in my language, we call her Justitia. And she is usually depicted, she's blindfolded, she carries a sword and a balance. And the point, the implication of this obviously is that her judgment should not be biased by her own opinions. It should only be based on whatever the hard evidence presented in the case. So you could say that the justice is blind and science is blind, but we are not dumb. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, that was a really, really good clip. Now, if you'd like to see more, first of all, I've been showing the entire five-part series. Each part's a little over an hour on cable access. This part is part three. It's the, actually the last 20 minutes of an hour and 40 minutes. So uh, anyway, it's called the uh, Toronto 9-11 hearings. The Toronto hearings on 9-11. That's what it is. Toronto hearings on 9-11. Watch your TV guide for the ones that are coming up on cable access or go to uh, YouTube and find them there. And it's well worth watching. There's almost five hours of that very same type of science. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about, since we have a community need for justice, one of the biggest problems with injustice in our country is the uh, unequal distribution of wealth. Now, it's tremendously off kilter. And uh, Amy Martin, who is a wonderful uh, news lady who talks on uh, a show called Breaking the Set, uh, a subdivision of Russia Today, I recommend it. Go to the Internet or watch it when it comes on. You'll even see Tom Hartman's on the Russia Today on Channel 29 on cable access once in a while if you want to watch Tom Hartman. But basically... Uh, 
Russia Today is a place to get news that our news people won't even touch because they're being political instead of news worthy, news hounds. So the, what we're going to show here is a Russia Today clip of Amy Martin talking about the 1% versus the 99%. Are we ready in the control room? Let her rip. Jobs, big corporations will continue to make record profits which of course will further extend the gaping disparity that already exists between the rich and the poor. Now, many of us already have a perception of this country's wealth distribution, but as this following video points out, that perception is severely skewed and sadly not in our favor. Check it out. Here's what we think it is again, and here is the actual distribution, shockingly skewed. Not only do the bottom 20% and the next 20%, the bottom 40% of Americans barely have any of the wealth. I mean, it's hard to even see them on the chart. But the top 1% has more of the country's wealth than 9 out of 10 Americans believe the entire top 20% should have. Mind-blowing. Mind-blowing indeed. In fact, it's even crazier when you look at the alarming trend of exponential financial growth for corporations since the recession and subsequent bailouts. According to Think Progress, from 2009 to 2011, 88% of this country's income growth went to corporate profits, while only 1% went to paying worker incomes. All, of course, with a no trickle down mechanism in place. In fact, a lot of corporations haven't hired any new employees in recent years. But it's okay because they're paying their fair share of taxes, right? Nope. Corporations are paying taxes right now at a rate that hit a 40 year low in 2011 if they pay anything at all. So, what do we do? Well, perhaps we should look at other industrialized Western countries who are taking the initiative to fight their robber barons. One of them is Switzerland. Now, let me set the backdrop really quickly. Recently, there have been proposals all across Europe to cap the salaries of those in top management positions. But Switzerland has taken it one step further. 68% of people in the country just voted for serious curbs on corporate wages. In a bill dubbed the Ripoff Initiative, voters approved giving shareholders a say on executive pay. It also bans the use of golden parachutes or huge bonuses and packages for executives joining or leaving the company. It mandates annual re-elections for directors and threatens three years in jail for those who violate the new rules. Imagine that, jailing people who violate laws. <laughs> The fact that so many people in Switzerland have spoken out says that they mean business. And the best part is that this bold move is encouraging other EU states to eye similar restrictions. But what about us? Yes, our government might be largely consisted of empty suits working to do the bidding of the banks, but if Switzerland teaches us anything, it's that we have the power. So if they did it, why can't we? Okay, indeed, why can't we? Well, there's another example coming up here pretty pretty quick. The next roll-in is another Amy Martin roll-in. Well, I think it is anyway. I might be wrong. But anyway, the subject is Iceland. Now, th they didn't go along with this austerity nonsense. I mean, where on earth did you get a PR guy who was able to sell the idea, hey, our bankers made a bunch of really bad bets, and they lost those bets and lost trillions of dollars. And we want you to give up your Social Security, give up your Medicare, give up, you know, your retirement, give up your bank account, and then live in great fear from everything else they've instituted. And we go along with that? Ben Bernanke and the other Wall Street white shoe boys completely embedded in Obama's uh, cabinet. Give me a break. The idea of giving the banks money when they mismanaged everything and then without even a requirement that they use the money to pay off the mortgages that everybody's worried about. No, no, no. They let those mortgages for, get foreclosed on. The banks sit on the money. None of that money's come out. They didn't hire new people. None of it's trickling down. Well, let's listen to what Iceland did. They put those bankers in jail in Iceland, boy. That's what we should do here. Poor folk needs for community justice. 
Let her rip if you're ready to play that next one. Well, anyway, I, I, I caught him off guard there, but we're going to play it as soon as it's ready. And uh, this is interesting because what they did is they went after the crooks, the crooks that were ripping us off. And they put them in jail. And how did they do that? They did it nonviolently. They did it by protesting every single day for a year in front of the, you know, in front of the, uh, uh, whatever their version of parliament is or, or Congress. It looks like we're having trouble with the video player in there. Well, we're, we're going to be talking about other things on that same subject. Like later in the show, we're going to have a roll in on the threat of hemp, the, the, the threat that hemp poses to the corporatocracies. Why was hemp illegal? It doesn't get you high. It's nothing that a hippie would smoke. You know, it didn't make anybody mad to go around raping your virgin daughters. So why did they make it illegal? That's another thing we're going to be talking about. It, it competes with the fibers. It competes with food. It competes with uh, fuel. All these wonderful things from the hemp seed. The first, the first car made actually ran on hemp oil. It was a diesel vehicle, hemp oil. Just all you have to do is crush the hemp seed. A, a farmer, a typical farmer, could get about a 95% pressing from seeds in his own crop. And it's about 300 gallons per acre that you could get. Ready to use, just filter out the chunks and put it right into your vehicle and run your tractors and everything for your farm on it. It was a wonderful thing. They, in, in World War II, they required that you grew hemp. It was a hemp for victory, hemp for uh, all kinds of products. They used it for, it makes, it's still to this day, it makes the strongest ropes that you can make is made out of hemp. Uh, they, the hemp sails, hemp, every sailing boat that you ever saw used hemp for its sails. Uh, in fact, that's where canvas came from. It's a kind of a variation of the word cannabis. And it's insane that it's illegal. It's just another example of why poor folk, like everybody that you know and everybody I know, need community justice. Community needs for justice. I get it all mixed up, but we need this justice. This is a, taking away a valuable resource that right now, if we legalized hemp in the Willamette Valley, Willamette Valley farmers would get rich. And we would supply well, uh, much needed food stuffs. We would supply textiles, and we would create industry like you would never see uh, on any other subject. It's it's amazing. Put, making hemp legal would put more people to work than any dozen politicians talking on the subject ever will do. So. If you ever get a chance, you know, insist that we make hemp legal. And then we can go on and talk about making marijuana legal. But uh, anyway, are we ready to roll any of these videos? Looks, looks like we're not. I, um, what's that? Did you know that there's a plastic, I'm sorry, a plant strong enough to replace plastic, oil, and building materials. And that the same plant has been cultivated for industrial purposes for over 12,000 years. Yet it's been classified as a Schedule One controlled substance drug by the U.S. government. Nope, not marijuana. Hemp. Recently, Kentucky Agriculture Minister, Commissioner James Cormer has requested a legal review of the steps necessary for hemp regulation. If the federal ban is lifted on growing the crop. That's right. Kentucky could soon be reviving an industry that only a century ago was considered to be the most important cash crop and vital to the strength of the U.S. economy. So let's backtrack a little bit and talk about what hemp actually is. Throughout human existence, hemp has been used as an important source of fuel, clothing, shelter, and even food for people all over the world. In this country, industrial hemp was widely cultivated since America's first settlers arrived in the early 1600s. In fact, even our founding fathers acknowledged hemp's enormous benefits. George Washington, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson all grew hemp on their private farms. And Jefferson was even quoted once as saying, hemp is one of the greatest important substances of our nation. 
The Declaration of Independence itself was even drafted on paper derived from hemp. So what happened? How did one of the most versatile and adaptable species of crops in the world also become one of the most politically polarizing agricultural resources? Well, in the early 20th century, the plant became labeled a threat so dangerous that it should be wiped out. But it wasn't dangerous to anyone or anything except the industries that it could phase out of existence. So what did the establishment do to ensure their allegiance to the very industries they serve? Well, they did what they do best. They lied and smeared hemp through a propaganda campaign that associated the plant with marijuana. And in 1937, the Marijuana Tax Act redefined hemp as a narcotic, which required farmers to obtain a special tax stamp to grow the crop. By 1970, the Controlled Substances Act made growing the crop without a DEA-issued permit strictly illegal. Because of the government crackdown on the crop, it has a negative association. And at this point, you still might be confused because of years of being brainwashed to think that hemp is exactly the same as marijuana or that its close association with it must classify it as a drug. But this couldn't be farther from the truth. Just check out the Congressional Research Service report on hemp that states, quote, although marijuana is also a variety of cannabis, it is genetically distinct from industrial hemp, and it is further distinguished by its use and chemical makeup. So hemp is genetically distinct from the drug, marijuana. In fact, if you smoked an entire garbage bag full of hemp, you wouldn't get high. Yet the plant remains illegal under U.S. federal law. And like I said before, not because it's a danger to people, but because it's a danger to corporations. In the early 20th century, hemp competed heavily with the cotton and paper industry. Because paper made from trees had to compete against environmentally friendly hemp products, the paper industry was at risk to suffer. So William Hearst, a New York State congressman and one of the biggest newspaper publishers in America, launched a campaign against hemp. He used his publication to smear the public's perception of the crop, which at the same time was threatening his successful paper company. In fact, this very campaign is where the term yellow journalism derived from. But this was in the 1920s. How is the propaganda still working today? Because the threat hemp poses isn't limited to paper. Reviving the industry could potentially devastate the profits of huge corporations that manufacture lumber, fossil fuels, steel, alcohol, and even food among many other things, including this. In 1941, Henry Ford even built a car made almost entirely from hemp. The frame of the car was 12 times lighter than steel and 10 times stronger. Not only that, but the car was powered by hemp seed oil. Do I even have to explain the threat that this technology would pose to giant oil companies? Process hemp also creates one of the strongest fibers we know of, providing all natural materials to build homes, ships, trains, planes, and automobiles, and practically indestructible clothing. Furthermore, hemp seed oil can be made into lotions and skin creams. The practical applications for this plant are limitless, and the reason it remains illegal is simple. It's just one giant push to preserve the profits of corporations that poison our planet, destroy our forests, and bankrupt the world. But this all could change if recent efforts in Kentucky are an indication, and if moves by a few key members in the U.S. Senate succeed, hemp could soon be removed from the government's list of Schedule I controlled substances. The hemp industry could very well be revived back to being America's number one cash crop, and that's one step closer to succeeding against a model of profit, greed, and control that sadly defines this country today. Well, we played the, uh, the video about the hemp, and uh, it just goes to show you another one of the times when our politicians don't care about what's right, don't care about what's just. They just go with the greed. Um, you can, I have lots of references, so you can contact me, and I'll give you some if you'd like to follow up on that. Uh, and, of course, watch Cannabis Common Sense on Friday at, what, 8 o'clock? I think that's the time it starts. In the meantime, um, we're going to go on to the next show here. We, this is something that kind of involves us directly right here in Portland. Uh, I don't know. I have no inside knowledge about what bribery was was committed or what uh, promises were made to politicians here in Portland or what skullduggery went on, but they actually 
What? You're not you're not showing me anymore. What's going on? Okay, we're, we're they, our control room pressed the wrong button there. But anyway, the point is, here in Portland, we're about to uh, have a vote on whether or not to put a, an industrial uh, toxic waste product into our water. I mean, what a brainchild somebody was. We got to get rid of all the toxic fluorine that's a byproduct of many industries. And what do we do with it? Well, I got an idea. It's not original. Let's do what they did in the nuclear industry when they had this so-called less radioactive product, but still highly radioactive. They called it depleted uranium. How do we get rid of it? Let's sell it to the military. They'll just shoot it everywhere at, with in their bullets. So this is another equivalent of that. Let's make everybody drink this poison and we'll pay we'll make them pay for it too it's going to cost what did they say uh five million dollars to set up the machinery that will fluoridate our water and then it'll cost six hundred thousand dollars a year to maintain it and then it's going to be poisoning us we're going to have all kinds of iq reduction as, as shown by a late harvard study well let's listen to what amy martin has to say I think they, they're probably ready to roll that one on. Well, maybe they're not. Okay, this is the proverbial dead air, but I can go on about fluoride. Okay, yeah, right on. They told me to keep talking. Well, this is cable access, and if you'd like to see less of this type of mistake, you can come down and get trained and start helping out do your community duty. You know, find a subject you like, make your own show. But getting back to this show, we're talking about fluoridation. And it's obscene what the federal government and others, this time it's a corporation, no doubt, that is trying to get us to poison our water. And make no doubt about it, that's not just some flip thing to say. It is poisoning the water because it's medicating you without regard to your dosage. Athletes would drink a lot of water while they're running. Maybe a little old lady drinks a lot of water in her tea or something like that. And not to mention people who are beer addicts are going to be drinking fluoridated beer. I mean, come on, folks. There's no other medication that they will allow you to self-medicate or, or allow somebody to prescribe to you without monitoring your dosage. The idea that, you know, they've declared a safe level, but they have no idea how much you're going to take I mean, it's ridiculous. It, none of it passes the laugh test. And yet, they're about to do it. And, I mean, it's, it, when it came across a politician's desk, they should have just said, get out of here. That's stupid. But instead, it went so far as to be approved. And then the big, there was an outcry. I guess that forced the election. Or maybe they planned on an election. But you watch, they're going to have a blitz where they're going to try to convince you that good for your teeth or something. Okay, here's that video. Without clean drinking water, life couldn't go on. So it's probably important that we know what's in the water we drink. The past 65 years, city governments nationwide have been adding a substance called fluoride to the water supply. The practice of water fluoridation started at a time in history when asbestos, PCBs, and DDT were all deemed safe and effective. And although all of these chemicals have been banned since, fluoridation is still a common practice. However, it's uniquely American. The U.S. has more people drinking fluoridated water than the rest of the world combined. In fact, most industrialized nations do not fluoridate their water, including Japan and 97% of Europe. So what exactly is it that we're ingesting? Well, it's not the same fluoride that's in your toothpaste. What's being added to municipal water supplies is a fluorine compound called hydrofluorosilicic acid and it's a byproduct from the phosphate fertilizer industry. Yes, you heard me right. Let me break this down for you. Gaseous fluoride is produced during fertilizer production. Now, it used to go straight into the atmosphere from these factories, but presently, filtration devices are used to contain the toxic chemicals, and what's extracted from the filters is then condensed into a water-based solution, which is packaged unrefined and sold to city governments for the purpose of water fluoridation. So how did this all start? Well, 
Interestingly, in 1944, the American Dental Association themselves published that it was not worth the health risk to fluoridate water supplies. Too bad no one heeded their warning, because the very next year, Grand Rapids, Michigan, became the first community to fluoridate. And what happened next would not have been possible without a push from the aluminum industry, which was looking for a way to safely discard their fluoride pollution and waste. In 1947, Oscar Ewing, a paid attorney for Alcoa, the biggest aluminum company in the U.S., was picked to oversee the Public Health Service, which is now known as the Department of Health and Human Services. He then made clear his lingering ties to the aluminum industry by promoting water fluoridation as one of the first official policies of the department. From there, the policy expanded tenfold, with an additional 87 U.S. cities fluoridating within the next three years. Fast forward to today, where children are growing up indoctrinated with the notion that fluoridated water is necessary because it prevents tooth decay. But is that really the case? In 1987, the National Institute of Dental Research examined 39,000 school children from 84 different fluoridated and non-fluoridated communities. And while the study did find that in fluoridated areas, tooth decay declined, the most interesting part is that there was a declining trend in tooth decay in non-fluoridated areas too, perhaps because of overall better hygiene. Okay, but not only is there no causal link, there's also serious health risks for fluoride overexposure. For one, an excess of fluoride causes fluorosis, which is the eating away of the enamel on your teeth. This is indicative of what it's doing to your body on a larger scale. You see, it doesn't just eat away at the tooth enamel. Only 50% of the fluoride we consume is excreted. The rest is absorbed throughout our bodies, our pineal glands, and our bones. In fact, an alarming study by the U.S. Public Health Service, which was later confirmed by Harvard Medical School, found that a deadly type of bone cancer called osteosarcoma was significantly higher in fluoridated communities than in non-fluoridated communities. However, the most distressing findings come from 18 studies done worldwide showing a substantial lowering of IQ in overly fluoridated areas. And there are many more adverse effects than just those. Not to mention that the FDA admits that fluoride is a drug, not a nutrient. Multiple ethical codes are being violated here by forcing us to ingest this drug. Look, let's call it like it is. Water fluoridation has nothing to do with said benefits. Think about it. We're already getting our fair share of this substance through the dentist and the toothpaste we use every day. And what about the processed foods we're already eating and drinking on a daily basis? We get more than enough. So the argument that we need to ingest this substance as well is baseless. Look guys, no matter what you think about fluoride, the real issue here is having a choice. No chemical, no matter what its alleged benefits are, should be forced upon the public without their consent. But let's not forget, as long as corporations are involved, our best interest isn't really the priority. So maybe we should be looking at water fluoridation as a money-making scam. It's a tale that's all too familiar. Governments and industry colluding to save money instead of saving lives. Okay. Yeah, now, that's right, a money-making scam. And I, we just had a caller call the station and they just caught me on the in between live parts of this show they mentioned that uh you know the portland city council is contemplating laying off firemen and policemen and other social services and yet we're about to vote on whether we can spend five million dollars to fluoridate our water to poison our water supply we we have the five million but we don't have enough money to keep our fire department and police departments up to the levels needed for uh, proper community management. It's just insane. When, when it does not fit what you think should be logical reason, there is, it, it's, it's not crazy. It, it makes absolute sense when you look at it from the point of view of somebody's pocket is really getting enriched. You know, somebody, some politician has a giant coffer for re-election now. 
um, it would be really nice to be able to investigate that stuff. And some of you folks out there might be an investigator types. Maybe you've never done it before. Why don't you try it? All right, we're ready for the next clip. So uh, we're going to play that Iceland clip if we can. Uh, I mean, yeah, well, we'll anyway, here we go. Violent riots, revolutions, uprisings, crackdowns on dissent occurring all over the world. From the ongoing protests in Greece and Spain to the Arab Spring, which gave rise to uprisings in Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, Bahrain, and Syria, among others, we've heard a lot about the changes occurring in these countries. But one revolution has gone almost entirely unnoticed, a peaceful rebellion that led to the resignation of a government and redrafting of a constitution, all in the midst of one of the most devastating financial crises in modern history. Since 2008, the subarctic nation of Iceland has been rising above the ashes of total financial collapse with a peaceful revolution that has led to an innovative new government. So to discuss the steps Iceland has taken to quietly reshape its financial infrastructure and system of governance through nonviolent dissent, earlier I spoke to Steiner Borschen, editor and economist of News of Iceland. I first asked him the steps the citizens of Iceland took in the wake of the financial meltdown. After months of protesting, the, the government went resigned and the new government was formed and parliamentary elections were held with a center-left government and they removed the board from the central bank and from the financial supervising authorities. Um, but they, for example, the, the central, the governor of the central bank, he refused to resign. So he, the government, the new government had to uh, had to change the laws about the central bank so that they could remove him and uh, appoint a new governor of the central bank. And then uh, a report was written by specialists, uh, economists and others who uh, went through all the details of the crisis and they prosecuted uh, those responsible. Uh, Yes. So let's go and, through, let's uh, go through a couple of these steps really quickly. So when we, when you yeah. say large protests in front of the parliament, how many people are we talking about here? The biggest the biggest uh, was 6000 people, I believe. Okay. And how much how how many people does Iceland have? 320,000 people. Okay. So that's a pretty big number um, comparatively. Uh, let's talk yes. about prosecuting the bankers though. I mean yeah. You know, <laughs> how was it that Iceland was able to prosecute big banks? I mean, were Iceland banks in the, in the first place not too big to fail? Was there more government regulation in place at the time that prevented that like it did in the U.S.? The thing is that the Icelandic banks were way too big to be saved. The, the balance sheet of the Icelandic banks was 10 times the Icelandic GDP. So the government uh, really did not have a choice. They they. They did not have the foreign reserves to save the banks, and they just and they just let the banks default because in play they just couldn't save them. And they were nationalized, correct? Yes, the first bank was nationalized. There were three large banks. The first one was nationalized, uh, but uh, and that and that sent out the signal that uh, the financial sector in Iceland was in a big trouble, and that led to a total collapse of the three banks. And, you know, coming from a country that really we see the state crushing dissent, I mean, the Occupy Wall Street movement absolutely crushed, it just seems like we don't ever hear about peaceful resistance actually making a change and, and, and having it be a tangible change. Um, how, how was it that people rose up peacefully and forced the government to resign in such a short period of time? Yes, that is quite amazing. but. Uh... Uh, I don't know what to say. The, they were, uh, they they protested daily and weekly for months. Uh, they threw eggs at the parliament, and the police had to uh, put up barriers around the parliament. and And they just continued doing this, giving speeches outside the parliament every day. And uh, I guess the the government just. Uh, decided to listen to the people. Wow, the government actually decided to listen to the will of the people, hear them. That is amazing. Oh my God, that's yeah. incredible. Um, let's talk about the constitution uh, that was formed or is in, in, still in the process of being formed. How did it come to be? What was the process of electing the people to write this new constitution? Well, right after the new center-left government uh, 
took office in 2009. They they decided that uh, the constitution uh, we needed a new constitution. They they thought that the constitution did it, that we we mostly got our constitution from Denmark and uh, it is quite obsolete in some parts, but it's it's good in many parts. And they they think that well a new constitution would could have been uh, better just for the democracy to to prevent. They just wanted to do it to prevent this from happening again. So Iceland, I guess you could say, I mean, it's inching toward direct democracy. It's the closest thing you can really get toward direct democracy. Um, but I mean, it's happening transparently as I've read. But I mean, are there any safeguards to prevent corruption, hijacking the new constitution and really preventing this transparent direct democracy from happening? Well, the the constitutional committee has uh, finished making the draft for the constitution and uh, n now that draft is at the parliament and the parliament is uh, going over te technical details they're changing it to so that it's more so that the legal terms are more correct and they're also they're also changing some chapters and doing a lot of modifications and it's very unclear if they will be able to uh, get the new constitution through before the parliamentary elections are held in two months. So, uh, but uh, it, it, it's, it's, some say it's not good that the parliament can just change the, the draft from the committee. Uh, so we will have to see what happens in the next two months if they can pull this through. Well, if they do change it, I don't doubt that there will be resistance from the people again and hopefully uh, prevent that from happening. You know, the country also has been awarding some of the world's strongest freedom of information laws, protections for journalists. In fact, um, the FBI was just kicked out of the country for trying to investigate WikiLeaks there. Talk about this and talk about these new laws to protect journalists. Well, the, the minister of the interior felt that the FBI was in Iceland on false pretense. The FBI had said that they wanted to investigate a computer attack on the government offices, but when they got to Iceland, they were what they really were doing was invest, investigating WikiLeaks and interrogating an Icelandic hacker related to WikiLeaks. And the minister of the interior said that uh, he did not know about this and that uh, he wanted, and that he actually said that this what the FBI, FBI was doing was illegal, and so he asked them to leave, and they did. Well, as we know, the FBI and has no is no stranger to really crossing their uh, you know the government overreach into different countries. I think I just interrupted you. What were you just going to say? No, I was just uh, about to say about the legislation about the the new uh, the information law. I don't know that ex exactly in detail, but it's, uh, it, 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 it protects journalists and, and, and sources and, and, and information quite a lot. So I think the most obvious question of all as we're going through these things, um, when we hear about unrest, revolt, violent revolt all around the world, constant a barrage of this on, a, on the mainstream media, why is it that Iceland's peaceful revolution is completely censored? <laughs> Is it censored? Absolutely. Right. We haven't heard one thing. You can barely even find information when you do a Google search on this. I'm not even kidding. Yeah, that, that's amazing. I don't know. I don't know how it is censored or how how, how that can be. But the the yeah, I don't know what to say. So uh, maybe people aren't very interested in uh, peaceful revolutions. They only want to hear about the other ones. Well, maybe sure. maybe they're scared of people picking up uh, the cue from Iceland and really moving forward and seeing that this is feasible, this is possible to have a nonviolent revolution and to overthrow the government and nonviolent means. Uh, that could be a possibility. Of course, the corporate media has the same vested interest that the government does. You can call them almost a propaganda arm of the establishment. But let's talk about about capitalism because I think you know what led to this collapse in Iceland is representative of kind of the systemic failure of contemporary modern capitalism this predatory capitalism that allows these huge too big to fail banks of course yours were too big to save um, do you think that Iceland's moving into a new innovative economic system integrating aspects of capitalism or are they simply leaving this model behind what is what is the economic model that you guys are moving forward with 
So the centre-left government that took office in 2009, they, they aimed at the Nordic, Nordic economic model, which uh, puts a lot of restrictions on the banks and uh, puts on a lot of regulation and supervision. But, uh, but before the elections are coming up now in, uh, in two months, and we will have to see the, the party that was in power in, for 18 years before the financial crisis in 2008, they, they are getting a lot of support again. So uh, it's very interesting to, to see how much support they will actually get in two months. And it might be quite substantial. Well, hopefully other countries can adopt uh, aspects of what Iceland has done, completely amazing, totally censored from the Western world, at least in this country. Uh, thank you so much for coming on, shedding some light on this crucial subject. We'll definitely be following the elections as they come up. Steiner Bjorton, really appreciate your time, economist and editor of News of Iceland. Thank you. Okay, now that's just typical of the banks and the way we're looking at them now is we've called them too big to fail so we have to s sacrifice all of our independent wealth for their mistakes well uh, then recently they caught those same banks laundering drug money well as if we didn't know I mean the, the government's running the drugs the government should have known who was doing the laundering but the point is Eric Holder, our attorney general, came out, and uh, apparently these guys in the banks, the banks are too big to prosecute. They're too big to fail, too big to prosecute. How about too big to save, like Iceland just proved? They're too big to save. Let them die. Um, it's, it's insane. Absolutely insane. Well, we've got about a minute to go here. We're just going to start rolling the credits. Uh, next week, I'm going to tell you how Multnomah County is trying to take my house where I only owe $7,000 of taxes and I own the house clear. I just have bad credit, so I can't get a loan anywhere to pay $7,000. So they're going to take my house. I'll talk to you more about it next week.